Prayers are in the form of blessings. For example, the Amida prayer is in the form of how many blessings? 18 plus 1. 19. That's right. And the, what do we have? Sukhe um, de Zimra, we sing God's praises. And we make a bracha at the beginning, make a bracha at the end. This is all forms of praise of Hashem. The brachos themselves are the praise. But then we also have mitzvot. Mitzvot, the mitzvah is not the bracha. The bracha comes before the mitzvah. The mitzvah itself is an action. Give me an example of a mitzvah action. Tefillin. Tzitzit. Netilat yadayim. Saying the Hallel, that's right, we saw there's a bracha before the Hallel, and then the Hallel itself, it's not a bracha, the Hallel itself is prakim of tehillim, and then a bracha afterwards is, is very uh, special. So the birkot mitzvah, the mitzvah itself, is not the bracha. In our prayer service, the, the, the prayers themselves are brachot, but here we have the mitzvah and we have the bracha beforehand. Give me an example of where we have within our prayers... <coughs> A birkata mitzvah. There's two examples that come to mind in Shacharit. One we covered, and one we didn't. Kohanim, they have to say a bracha before they give us the blessing. That's true, I wasn't thinking of that. There's, there's two that each and every one of us does every day. Tzitzit? Tzitzit is good, yes. Tfilin is good, that's the obvious, but more than that. Shema. Good. The Shema, to recite the Shema is you're supposed to recite these passages, three passages, right? Farim uh, 6, 13, whatever it is, right? 6, 11, and, and then Bamidbar, Parshat Shlach, right? We say these three passages. That's not a bracha. Ah, we have a bracha before it. And after. And after it. Two brachot before it, even. And in Marav, two brachot after it. But that's an example of Birkat HaMitzvah. At least one of them should be Birkat HaMitzvah. We see, we're going to study them and see that they have a very special form. But there's one other example. There's one other example that we've covered. Torah? Good. The blessings on the Torah. The mitzvah is to study Torah. We say the blessings beforehand. This is also unique. How many blessings do we say before we study Torah? Three. Three. You'd expect like most other mitzvot, there's one blessing before you do the mitzvah. Before you put on the tzitzit, you put on, make one bracha. Before you put on the tefillin, you make one bracha. Or, some people will make two brachot before tefillin, right? It's Fardy Mashkinazim. So, but, uh, before uh, learning Torah, we make three blessings. Very good. Alright, so let's take a look at a few other mitzvot which are in the Siddur, where we have special brachot for them. <coughs> Page 1077, second last line, on fixing a mezuzah. Has anybody ever done this before? Yes, very nice. Did you say the bracha beforehand? Yes. The mitzvah itself is to put the mezuzah on the door. You say it in the shah. Good, read me that. There's a bracha first. That's right. Sheki chanu sarativar alikaboa mezuzah. And as next one, has anybody done this? I have. Baruch Hashem, we can walk up. Kitchen, we can walk up. You don't have a house, so you can't do the mitzvah. That's right. You have to have a house. You have to be building it. You have to. But the, the truth is, I think Machon Meir has a big problem. The roof doesn't have a proper fence. The roof is the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, you so you go up to the roof, not all of it is, is surrounded by a fence. Maybe some of it is, and some of it isn't. Yeah, but you have to kind of break into that part of the roof. There's Do a, you? There's a fence that your people are trying to... Oh, you're not supposed to go there? Ah, oh, I didn't realize. Okay. Okay, so... It's your own fault. But still, I would... I would uh, if I was in charge, I'd bake that a priority. I think it's a mitzvah, though, right? The yeah. middle blessing here, taking chal? What, what page are you on? It's the same page. Oh, the same That's page, just chala. above it, yeah. So, the word chala is used for two different things. One is the bread that we eat for Shabbat, special bread. It's usually braided bread, and it's usually delicious. 
Sometimes it's not so delicious. That's challah, which we have on Shabbat. But there's another meaning of the word challah, and that is actually a pasuk in the Torah. A pasuk in the Torah referring to challah is not referring to the braided bread. It's referring to a portion of the dough that you must separate off from the dough in order to make it kosher. If you don't separate off that little piece of dough, it's called challah. If you don't separate off the challah, and then, and you give that challah to the kohanim, if they're pure, and nowadays they're not pure, so we just burn it, but because nobody can eat it, but the, the, the bread is not kosher until you've taken off this, this, this tithe. It's a form of tithe. Uh, it's called challah. 10%? It's not 10%. Yeah, it's not 10%. Take a handful and then you wrap it in. That's nowadays. The, that, that's nowadays. Put it in the fire or in the garbage. It's up to you. Uh, it's best to, to, to burn it, but it's not always practical in our ovens where we don't have a, a live fire. Some people just put it into the, into, in a bag and put it in the garbage can. We are not allowed to eat it. It's only for the kohanim who are pure and they can't eat it either. Kohanim today can't eat it. And so we take separate off the challah so that we can eat the rest of the bread. Uh, but if you don't, it's not kosher. If you lo- go to the bakery, if you go, sometimes you buy a package of bread, it'll say on it, this is kosher, and it says, hufrash chala. It doesn't mean that the bread is chala. Bread is pita. The bread is some kind of a roll. But it, what it was saying there is referring to this meaning of the word chala, that the mitzvah of taking off this, this tithe called chala has been done. And if you go to a big bakery, they have lots and lots of dough, Lots of big doughs, and the rabbis are there at every step along the way to make sure that the schala has been separated. Is that clear? Two meanings of the word, yeah. But we're going to learn more about the different tithes on the top of the page, 1077. Hashem next week, we'll get ready for Tu Bishvat. We're going to talk a little lot about fruit and how to make fruit kosher. Believe it or not, you have to circumcise your fruit. No, so just joking. <laughs> Just joking, but there is something you gotta do to make the food kosher. Okay, turn the page. Other mitzvot. Well, this is one which uh, some of you will be doing. It's a special one for Tvilat Gerim, one of the rituals that uh, we use in Judaism for a transition between one state and another state. Like the Kohen, who was impure, and he was going to go worship in the temple, he had to go into the mikvah. So he would become into a pure state. And a woman who was prohibited to her husband, um, after her cycle, she goes to the mikvah, and she uh, does that mitzvah of purifying herself, so that then she becomes permitted to her husband. Before immersing into the mikvah, there is a bracha. Al Hatevila. And we do the same ritual of transition for dishes, believe it or not. Dishes who were that were created, formed, fashioned, owned by a non-Jew, and a Jew wants to use them, he has to put them into the mikvah first and make a bracha before the mitzvah tvilat kelim. Keli is in singular. If it's plural, it's al tevilat kelim. You see that on the top of page 1079? Yeah? Has anybody done this mitzvah of tevilat kelim? Yes. Yes, you've seen that? Pesach. So sometimes, well, before Pesach, a lot of people get new dishes. And so the new dishes, if you've bought them from a non Jew, most of the dishes are made in. China. China. Mm, most in China. India's got a lot of catching up to do with China. Even in India, it comes from China. <laughs> so if the uh, dishes come from a non-Jew, uh, you have to uh, bring them into the uh, uh, a different state of holiness. And we do that through the mikvah. So we, we so before Pesach, a lot of people buy new dishes. But there's something else that's going on before Pesach. And that's kashering the dishes. That's, if they had any taste in them, like a new dish doesn't have any taste in it. It wasn't used for non-kosher food. But let's say you use, and 
some food and it got milk and meat in it, the, the dish becomes prohibited for use until you kosher it, until you go through a process. But that's not in the mikvah. That's a process of putting it in boiling water or putting it in the oven. That's not mikvah. Mikvah is for new dishes. Mikvah is for new dishes and uh, it's for that transition between the non-Jewish state to the Jewish state. There's a debate. I don't know if the rabbi uh, who spoke here the other day, Rabbi Broid, mentioned this explicitly. There's a debate whether or not a convert converts, he goes into the mikvah. Like we said, this is the ritual. Unfortunately, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash in the olden days. To convert, you had to bring a, a, a sacrifice. But we don't have sacrifices. So you get off, save a thousand bucks. But you've got to go into the mikvah. And if you don't have a Brit Milah, you have to have a Brit Milah. But uh, I guess the mikvah is much easier than the Brit Milah. And women, of course, don't have a Brit Milah. But women go into the mikvah when they convert. So the question is, now we're adults converting. I own dishes. The dishes I own today are owned by a non-Jew. In an hour, I'm going to go to the mikvah. The dishes will be owned by a Jew. What about the concept of Tevilat Kelim? We've got to immerse the dishes. You might as well take them with you. Come into the mikvah with your dishes. But it's a little impractical. Well, isn't there usually another mikvah outside of the mikvah? There is. There is a special Tevilat Kelim mikvah. A special tiny little... You don't have to take off your clothes. <laughs> There's a, like a, a trap door where you can sort of lower down the, the dishes into the, the small uh, bathtub type of thing, which is a kosher mikvah for the kelim, called the mikvah kelim. It's the cold, dishes. It's cold water? It's cold water, yeah. No reason to heat it. I mean, your fingers get a little cold, but uh, the proper mikvah, usually it's heated. It depends what part of the country you live in. But you can also do uh, any open body of water. That's true. The laws of mikvah are, the laws of mikvah are vast, and uh, there are other options other than the, you could call them the uh, civilized or constructed mikvahs that we use in the modern world. There are natural solutions, of course. However, when it comes to tefillat kelim, here there's a debate. Some rabbis say, well, like I said, it belonged to a non-Jew and it belongs to a Jew. You have to take all your dishes to the mikvah. Israel, when you converted in New York, did you take your dishes to the mikvah afterwards? Did they tell you? Mikveh, for dishes. You did after? Wow, okay, so, and they told you to make a bracha on it? Some people say you don't make a bracha, because it's a debate whether or not you have to. Other people say, it depends if it's made from metal or, or glass, then you do say bracha, other things you don't. In general, nobody says a bracha uh, on all the dishes. If it's earthenware, you don't make a bracha on the, putting in the mikvah. Uh, you do, excuse me, if it's glass, uh, sorry, if it's glass or metal, then you make a bracha. If it's other thing, anything else, you don't make a bracha. But there is an opinion which says that here's some magic. Are you ready for the magic? They say that when the convert goes into the mikvah, all of his dishes become converted automatically. You don't have to put them into the mikvah. Automatically, it's your dishes. You're the you're the. They belong to you. The 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 halacha is if you buy dishes from a non-Jew and you bring them into your home, then you have to put them in the mikvah. But if you already own them and you yourself turn into a Jew, there's no such precedent for. So we don't find it in the, in the Talmud, really even in the codes, until the last uh, few hundred years. So one of the great rabbis of our generation, Rav Shavai, says, we don't find it anywhere in the codes. It must be that there's no obligation. We're not quite sure what the logic is, but it must be that we don't uh, require tevilat kelim for a convert who converts. Um, other poskim say, do it without a bracha, just to be sure. But there's different opinions on that. Um, and uh, to this day, I think there are different customs. Some rabbis tell the, the converts to make a bracha. Some tell them to put the dishes without into the mikvah without a bracha. And some people say you can rely on this opinion that uh, you don't need, you're not, you're not required to toll your dishes if you're converting. 
because we never find in all the codes, in hundreds of years of literature, uh, in the laws of conversion. You would expect this to be a law. You convert, okay, so you've got to start with cushioning your dishes, but it doesn't appear anywhere. So some people say that's strong enough for proof, but you don't have to. Uh, but there's different opinions. Anyways, our, onwards. So this is interesting. He says here, in, in line three here, there's a bracha on wearing new clothes. Well, I've never heard of that. I say it every day in the morning. It's one of the 15 morning blessings. God clothes the, uh, the naked. We appreciate that we have uh, that we are human, that we have clothing to to wear. This is part of our basic needs. Hashem provides for us. Clothes the naked. And the Chazal mandated this as a daily bracha, as part of our every morning, everyday morning blessings. But to say it when you wear a new clothing, I, I've never I don't know where he gets this from. It's a strange I I would put a question mark on that one. I'd have to look it up uh, a little more thoroughly. But that's right. The custom, the standard custom is if you buy a new suit, if you buy a new shirt and you're very happy about it, you feel good, you feel uh, fresh, you feel uh, new and, and uh, pampered, uh, so then you, make, uh, you should bring that joy to God and bless Hashem. And you, the standard blessing is, Shechianu v'kimanu. Rigianu l'zmanazeh, who kept me alive, preserved me. And brought me to this uh, time. So you celebrate good things by saying Shekhyanu. Here is a specific bracha on, on wearing new clothes. I don't know uh, what the source for that is. And, and uh, it's before or after? It's upon. When you, when you put them on, you feel the, the, good, the, 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 the joy. Truth is, the custom used to be to make the bracha when you bought it from the store. You bring it home. But nowadays the custom is to, to only when you wear it, first time you wear it. I guess in the olden times they didn't have that separation. People didn't have a wardrobe at home with 30 shirts. You would go to the store when you needed, got a new dress and you would wear it home. That was it. And so that was the moment of joy. But nowadays we pray, we, they package it up for you in 16 layers and all sorts of wrapping paper. And then you take it home, and you, you take it out, and then for the special occasion, you're getting ready. Take it out of the closet, and you put it on, and you wear it. And so we sort of separate the two, the buying from the wearing, but uh, that's the common custom today. We, put the, we make the bracha when you, when you wear it. This relates to, we thought, mentioned it in the summertime, the question of the sad, the sad times for the Jewish people. But there's certain practices of mourning during the three weeks leading up to Tisha B'Av, the national mourning. And one of the rules is you're not supposed to say the Sheikh Yana blessing. Oh, I thank Hashem who kept me alive and brought me to this time. This time is not a happy time. So you really shouldn't be praising Hashem. So if you're not supposed to say Sheikh Yana, so that's where we get to the rule that during that time period we shouldn't go shopping to buy new things because you want to say the Sheikh Yana. Of course, nowadays it seems to be a, a, a pretty cogent loophole to say, well, I'll buy it, but I'm not going to wear it. Yeah. Because nowadays we only say the Sheikh Yana when we wear it. That doesn't matter. The custom is we don't, we don't buy new things because that is some element of joy as well. Unless, unless of course, there's a sale. Got to get things on sale. Exception is if you can choose by wholesale. Money, you can, you can, uh... If there's going to be a loss, you can you can make a shechina. You know? Also, even if you see a new fruit, and you realize that it's the three weeks, but this new fruit, I'm never going to see it again. This is not such a new fruit. I'm just, for example. Mm -hmm. But if you see that you, I don't know, you, there's a someone passing by who happens to have, I don't know. Uh, some uh, special uh, star fruit. And you, they won't be in the, you've never seen them in the market before and you won't see them afterwards. So this is your opportunity to have this special fruit 
that overrides, and you're allowed to have the uh, new fruit and say the shechiyan on the new fruit. You don't only say shechiyan on new clothes; you also say it on a new fruit. If it's the season, you you uh, make the shechiyan. If it's going to pass, the opportunity is going to pass. Then you're allowed to even during the three weeks. Also, getting back to what Rav Menachem asked me as I was walking in, I was planning to go to my friend's house this morning. It didn't work out, but um, my friend is getting up from Shiva. She's burying his son. So the custom is, we talked about the different stages of mourning, right? Remember we said, what was the first stage called before the burial? Onen. Onen, good. Then we said comes the first stage of mourning, which happens from when the grave is covered till... The end of seven days. The first period. The first period is seven days. So for Shiva, so he didn't leave the house. He didn't go to work. He, uh, I mean, shave. did not shave. And um, the music. Uh, that's right. That's right. All that. And this whole week, he had people coming in to comfort him. He didn't cook and clean. He didn't do anything. Pretty much, he's supposed to not take his mind off of his morning. He can bathe, right? Bake? Bake. Bathe? No, you're not allowed to bathe either. That's bathing for pleasure. Of course, for hygiene, you can do what you need to, but uh, no, no hot showers. Take a cold one. Yeah, if you need to. If you need for hygiene, you can take a cold one. I don't know if he does that, uh, but uh, it's it's it could be rough. Uh, we're used so used to bathing every day, hopefully. Um, but uh, not bathing for a whole week can be quite difficult. It's it's uh, it's a challenge, and I'm sure that one of the first things he's doing today after getting up. It's the seventh day. The custom is the beginning of the seventh day is considered to be the whole day. So he actually doesn't have to complete the whole day of the seventh day of morning. Seventh day of morning, you just sit a little bit in the morning, and then the seven days period is up, and then you're allowed to take a shower. Basically, the first thing he's he's going to do is to bathe. Um, Now, what's interesting is that ushers in the second period of morning. Second period of morning lasts from day 7 until day 30. So how many days is that? How do we have left? 23 days. Another three weeks approximately, plus two days. There is another stage of mourning. The way I like to describe it usually is that... Uh, did you ever fall off your bike? Yeah. Scrape your knee? Um. Sometimes you did worse than that. Sometimes you really got a wound. You got cut. Did you ever cut your fingers or cut cut? Uh... So sometimes you go to the hospital, and so they stitch it up. Sometimes you ever need stitches? Right here, your chin. Never, never had stitches. Bitten by a dog. There, you probably need some stitches. It depends how deep it is and so forth. And what else do they put on? They said they stitch you up. What else do the doctors do? They put on a bandage, what else? Antiseptic. Antiseptic, sometimes even some antibiotic cream, just to make sure that it doesn't get infected. Tons of stuff. There's lots of, lots of uh, care, lots of uh, features of, of the medical treatment. And then, about a week later, in the ancient time, they used to take out the stitches. Sometimes now they use stitches that just dissolve. But... But uh, a week later, you go to the nurse or whatever it is, and they make sure that the wound's not infected. They take off the bandage. The bandage was like a big bandage to cover the whole area. And all that antiseptic, now you can shower. Now you can go back to your life. And they probably put on some more cream to make sure it heals well, and maybe a Band-Aid or something like that, a smaller bandage. But you go on, and then uh, probably another week or two weeks later, and this wound starts to heal. You don't even need a bandage. You don't even need any anti- antiseptic or anti, anti uh, you know, uh, uh, infectious uh, antibiotic cream. And so then you, uh, you, you don't need any bandage. The scar many times remains, but the treatment gets less and less with time. So the pr- same process is the way our sages instituted the stages of mourning. It starts off very, the most severe. You don't do any mitzvot. I said in the period of owning. Mm-hmm. Nothing. 
You're not obligated in anything. It's, it's, that's like totally relieving you of any responsibilities. Uh, and, and you're supposed to just focus on your, on your loved one. No brachot either. No brachot. Nothing. Yeah. Tfilot? No. No brachot. No tfilot. You don't even say no mention of Shem's name? No. It's very hard for some people. Some people, you know, want to, but it's uh, the simple halacha is that no, until that the, that the the grave is closed, you uh, you don't say any brachot or tefilot or any other mitzvot. You don't put on tefillin. You don't do. Let you know. me dance in some cases. Right, right. So when it gets to be longer, the standard halacha is it remains, and that's why we we try to bury as soon as possible. One of the reasons, but. Um, yes, that, that's the strict halacha. There are situations where if you're just waiting for someone and there's nothing to be done anymore, you're not so preoccupied with the burial, there are situations where the rabbis will say, okay, now the period of onain has finished, even though you haven't really started the next period of avilut. It's, it's a complicated, each case is a little bit different. The, uh, the parameters of this halacha are very interesting. But I want to focus on stage two and stage three. Stage two, we said, when you're in the shiva, stage two, there's a lot of laws. Like I said before, you sit on a low chair. You don't wear shoes. Seven days. Leather shoes, anyways. You know, but some of the laws from Tisha B'Av, you're mourning for Jerusalem. That's, it's actually, when we get to the national mourning, it's the opposite. We start off with a, just a few commemorations and then when we get to more towards the intense day of Tisha B'av, then all those other, all the customs kick in. We don't work. We don't. Um, we don't uh, sit on a on a proper chair. And uh, we don't say shalom, one to another. So when you go to a shiva house, you don't say shalom. You don't greet. Um, but when the shiva is over. So all those extreme practices, like we said, the big bandage and the antibiotics and the, the stitch, all that, we, we take it down a notch. There's still avelut. My friend is still considered to be an avel for 30 days. Another 23 days, right? 30 days. And what are the laws of these 30 days? He does go back to work. He is allowed to bathe. The truth is, in the ancient times, they wouldn't bathe so much either for the full 30 days. But again, our, our hygiene, is, our standards are very different. And, but the law remains, he shouldn't be taking a luxurious bath for 30 days. He can take a shower much easier than he was during the shiva. But uh, he doesn't cut his hair for the entire 30 days. He's going to grow a beard, my friend. 30 days. What else are the laws of the 30 days? Of Avelut. He's allowed to go back to, to prayers? He's, he must, sure. He's already praying during the Shiva. Mm -hmm. He did prayers in the Shiva, but he's allowed to leave his house mm -hmm. and go to the shul. Yes. And, and not only is he allowed to, one of the uh, obligations is to say Kaddish. In many, many customs uh, in the Ashkenazi world is that he should lead the services as well. Mm -hmm. Not only just to say the Kaddish. He should uh, recite, he should be the Chazan. For the entire 30 days, except for Shabbat. Shabbat's too festive and he's sort of, he'll bring people down. We don't want that. And he should leave the synagogue? The no, Shabbat no, he doesn't have to leave. But he shouldn't lead. He shouldn't lead the, the services. Is that the, the monas leave? I'll tell you what that is. What you're referring to, you've probably seen this, is that the, during the Shiva, the mourner usually stays at home, has a minion at home, but not on Shabbat. Shabbat, there is morning but it's not in public and one of the practices that developed at least in the Ashkenazi communities is that we want to give the chance for the community to offer condolences to say this special rite of Nechama but we said in the Sephardic version it's three words tenuchamu mina shamayim what the word meant and the Ashkenazi version is hamakom yinachem etchem May the place, meaning God, comfort you. Betoch Sha'ar, among the rest, Avele Tzion, Yerushalayim, mourners of Tzion and Jerusalem. So this sentence of comfort 
in the Ashkenazi communities, it developed that the, for the first time now, the warner is coming back to the synagogue on Friday night. During the Shiva, he was away. Let's say, uh, my friend, uh, he buried his son on Monday. Oi. So came Friday night. He's still in the middle of the Shiva until this morning. So he buried him on Tuesday. So he gets up on Monday morning. So he's still in the middle of the Shiva. So he wasn't, Mincha, he probably davened at home with a special minyan that they gathered for him. But now for Shabbat, there's no special minyan at home. He's allowed to go to shul. He's allowed to leave his house because if he were not to, that would be public display of mourning. And we don't do public displays of mourning on Shabbat. So he's coming to shul. But when he's coming to shul, the truth is it's a very strange custom because most mourners I know of would probably just want to quietly go into a corner and not talk to anybody and not have any spotlights shined on them. But the community wants to participate in this mitzvah of comforting him. And it's a way of showing respect and we're not just ignoring what you're going through. And so there is a custom that in the, somewhere in the middle of Kabbalah Shabbat, it's usually before Mizmor Shir Yom Shabbat, um, the community stands up, the mourner walks in, everybody says the and he goes and sits down, um, and then uh, the, the, the services continue. So it's sort of a way of a public acknowledgement and comforting of, of the uh, person who's in the middle of Shiva, but not anymore. Now, well, now we're talking about the next stage. He brought me back with that custom of, of Kabbalah Shabbat. Uh, that was during Shiva. That was during Shiva only. During that Shabbat, it during Shiva. After that, he goes back to work. He goes back to, to shul. He, he's uh, there three times a day. If he's uh, going to say the Kaddish, uh, the custom is to say quite a few times a day. And so, but what still remains? What customs of Avilut? So we said he shouldn't cut his hair. <coughs> he's allowed to sit on a regular chair already after the shiva is over. So what remains? Music. Music. Very good. Dancing, going to weddings. 30 days, he's not allowed to participate. He can sing without music. You're allowed to sing, especially in your prayers. Shabbat songs, you're allowed to sing even during the, the uh, Shiva. But yeah, for, for the, the entire 30 days, what else? What about husband and wife? They can be back together again. It's only for the Shiva that they're not allowed to sleep together. Yeah, Seven days, that's a, that's a tough one. But after seven days, yeah, they go back to, to regular life. So what else? The one other one other custom that <coughs> I was reminded of now that we were talking about the brachot. One bracha. Oh, they they um, no. the shechian. The shechian. Custom is just like we said. We all. Don't say Shekhiyanu during the three weeks before Tisha B'Av because it's a time of national mourning. So in your personal mourning also, custom is not to say Shekhiyanu for the 30 days. So for 30 days, you don't go shopping and buy new clothes because then you won't be able to say the Shekhiyanu. So you, shouldn't, uh, you should avoid shopping. <clears throat> for 30 days, buying new things, it's not the right time. That's it. For you personally, it's a time of, of you're not happy that Hashem brought you to this time. It's a, it's a time of mourning. And so that's the custom. For 30 days, you don't uh, say the Shekhiyan. That's where we got onto this. Now, my friend is clean shaven usually. Very careful about it. Doesn't have a beard, but now he's going to have a beard for 30 days. That's, and then after the 30 days is over, those are really the, the mitzvot of Shiva and Shloshim. Those are the, and Onaim, the first stage. Shiva, second stage, and Shloshim is the third stage. Uh, after that, it's over. After that, my friend can take a shower, uh, uh, a, a hot bath if he wants. He can, and swimming goes together with that, with bathing for pleasure, usually. And he's allowed to uh, cut his hair after 30 days. Usually we say that shaving goes along with cutting hair. Something a little more festive about it. Although there's, there's room to make distinctions. Some people have to shave 
to go to court, for example. Right? People work in a certain context, in a culture where if you're non-shaven, they'll think you're being disrespectful. So there's different... Uh, and somebody who shaves every day, it's not, so, it's not so festive. It's just part of your personal grooming. But the custom is, in, in most parts, that if possible... Nowadays, the custom is that most religious Jews don't shave for the 30 days. Here in Israel, everybody knows the concepts of Avilut. Even secular Jews know that there's an idea, you should say Kaddish, and that you should let your hair grow, let your beard grow for 30 days. That is the custom. Um, and then mourners, so far, so good. This is the mourner. A mourner of seven days and a mourner of 30 days. Different mm-hmm. stages of mourning. The mourner's Kaddish. What's it called? Is it Kaddish Avalut? Mourner's Kaddish. Kaddish Yatom, it's called. The, the, uh, the, uh, an orphan's Kaddish, really. But there, there are different types of Kaddish. We'll talk about them another time when we talk about prayer. But I want to say one more word about the laws of Avalut is that you don't say Shekhiana for 30 days, right? Mm-hmm. You don't wear new clothes. You don't go to weddings. You keep saying the Kaddish for 30 days. There is one more stage. Not for my friend. And not if your spouse dies. And your parents? Or if your sister dies. Only 30 days. Everything we said up till now, 30 days. That's the standard type of Avilut. There's a special additional stage for your parents. They say it's because what do you have a special mitzvah towards your parents? Respect. Right, to honor and to fear your parents. You're supposed to fear them and honor them. And so that translates into an extra stage of Avelut. Continue to say the Kaddish for an entire year. We continue to not take a haircut for an entire year. My father grew out of his beard. I grew out my beard for the entire year when my father passed away. If I remember correctly, yeah. There is a, there is a workaround. They say that if, we're talking about the third stage, if your friends come to you and say, hey, you know, that, that beard looks disgusting, then you can take it off. It's called ge'ara. Yeah. Ge'ara. So you have to have good friends come over very quickly on day 31 and say, listen, the beard doesn't look good on you. And no hair. You take it. hair cutting as well. Hair cutting as well. So after 30 days, uh, if someone says to you that's not appropriate, it's just not looking good, then um, then you're allowed to take a haircut after 30 days. But uh, even for a, when a parent dies. But the law of Shekhianu stays. No shopping. For an entire year. Some people that's very difficult. And no weddings. You don't go to weddings. You don't dance. No dance parties for an entire year. That's only for parents. The, stage is, the third stage of Avilut is for the entire year. But you can go to Brit Milah? It's a good question. There's different customs about that. Depends. Most Brit Milah doesn't have live music. Live music is worse. And so if there's no live music and the point of, of, of the celebration is a mitzvah celebration, say, well, if it's for the sake of a mitzvah, mm-hmm. some post are more lenient and they allow you to participate in a brit milah. Some people say, just go for the ceremony and just don't stay to eat. But, you know, the eating is the, the celebration. That's, the, that's too, not appropriate when you're a mourner. But you will find different customs. There's some differences between Sephardim and Ashkenazim here about the different customs of that. But essentially, it's primarily weddings that is the problem. That's mentioned already in the Talmud that you're not supposed to. Weddings is the biggest party that a Jew knows of. <laughs> that uh, wedding is the biggest party. So to say, I'm planning one soon for my son. Oh, I'm about to sign on the, the hall. Is that the Shem today? The Sha'a Tova, it's not going to be for another four months, but uh, we're saving the date and saving the uh, hall. Are we all invited? Uh, if you pay for yourself, yes, but if you think I'm going to pay 200 shekels each ahead for all of my students, I don't think uh, I could uh, afford to uh, eat <laughs> the next day for about a year. 
It's going to be in Kfar Etzion, Be'ezrat Hashem. It's in Gush Etzion. We, we spent Shabbat there. Mm-hmm. Were you there? You weren't there. You don't go. You didn't go. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. So in that in that tent, like, it's an event hall, that with that tent, with the beautiful view, you know, where we took the picture on Friday. Remember? Yes. You were there, you were there Israel, for Shabbat in Kfar Etzion. So that's where the wedding will be, Be'ezrat Hashem. So no, I don't think I'll be able to invite all of you. I'd love to have you. Celebrate with me. We'll celebrate. We'll celebrate here. We'll have a we'll have a, a mini celebration, like Carlo mini. This is a, we'll have a, a mini a mini celebration. Question about the um, parents. Yeah. That's for uh, a Jewish person with Jewish parents. True, true. The, here we had this talk from Rabbi Broid a few weeks ago. Last week, I think it was. <coughs> he came in to, uh, uh, as an expert who wrote a book on the laws of converts, he discussed what are the laws for a convert whose parents die, for example. And officially, when you convert, you're like a newborn baby. You don't have the relatives. So, on the other hand, they're your parents. And they brought you up, and you have a debt of gratitude to them. So, the, the bottom line is that the standard rules of obligation that we're discussing now, obligations of mourning, do not apply to your biological parents once you become Jewish. The, everything I'm describing now is the laws of Jews mourning Jews. But whenever we have this transition of a Jew mourning for a non-Jew, the standard laws don't apply. However, he made a point of stressing that there's no prohibition. And as a matter of fact, it's probably advisable and probably the right thing to mourn for your parents in, in some fashion. It doesn't have to be exactly the same fashion we do for Jews. You don't have to maybe sit the entire Shiva. You could sit for one day, sit for three days, sit for, you know, um, and, you know, uh, maybe grow out your hair for 30 days and not for 12 months. Whatever it is, uh, the rules are much more flexible because they really don't apply if the parent is not Jewish. Some measure of respect and mourning you should show, definitely, and some people find the easiest thing is just to keep the pattern of as if they were Jews. You keep the standard pattern. Many posts have said you can say Kaddish for your parents, even if they're not Jewish. And you can uh, definitely lead the services. Why not? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but, for example, I had a good friend of mine who was a convert. She converted and she married a friend of ours. And they're friends. And we invite them to our weddings of our kids. They, we, they just married off a kid. We went to their wedding. Very nice. Now, her mother just died right before one of our weddings. So we were in our mind thinking, well, you know, after your parent dies, you don't go to weddings. So maybe we won't invite her. Maybe we'll. She called us up and said, listen, you all know that my parents are not Jewish. And I really like weddings. I want to come to the wedding. So please save me a seat. So we did, by all means. And she did nothing wrong. It wasn't like she had to keep to the strict rules that apply between Jews and Jews. Because her parents are not Jewish and there was no secret about it. Some people don't want you to know that they're secretive about being a convert. Everybody's a little different. And you have to respect their sensitivities. But in this case, she called us up and told us, listen, <laughs> I know officially or you know, on paper... The standard is that once your parent dies, you don't go to weddings for a year. Maybe it was a month after. I don't know exactly how long it was. But I know that in my case, the law doesn't apply. And and I don't think it's disrespectful to my mother. She would want me to live life and be happy. And so I want to come. So I said, great, you can come. There's no no prohibition, like I said, if it's it's a a complicated transition uh, situation. There's other cases. Other very interesting questions. It's what happens uh, with mixed families? And, uh, some some people are Jewish, some are not Jewish, and you know it's very complicated. See, if one person's sitting shiva, the other one's not sitting shiva. You know, so it's, he uh, he talked about it a little bit, and you can see more about it in his book. But uh, as I said, the rules are more flexible. But in, in in essence, you should show some respect, but the rules are more flexible. Anyways, back to the laws of. We talked about this because we talked about Shechianu. So Shechianu applies for 30 days for most types of Avelut. 
Except for, for your parents, the custom is not to buy new things for an entire year, not to go to weddings for a year. Now, people find that very hard. Like the story I told you about this woman who really wanted to come to the wedding. Like I said before, the reason why weddings are prohibited is because that's like the highlight. That's like the highest pinnacle of joyous celebrations that Jews have. We don't have New Year's parties. We don't have, uh, I don't know, Christmas parties. The biggest party in the Jewish life cycle is a wedding. And so a lot of people want to come. Now what happens is, what if it's a really good friend of yours and you want him to share with you on your day of Simcha? So luckily my good friend, I want to invite him to my son's wedding, but it's going to be in four months. So he'll be done with his 30 days. And it's not his parent that died, it's his son who died. And so there's no law of 12 months. It's only 30 days. So I, hopefully he'll come. I'm sure, obviously he'll be hurting inside. It's a very, very difficult situation. How many children does he have? He has three. Three boys. One of them was killed. The eldest was killed. Just, uh... And of course, you know, he's, a, he's 26. He's of marriageable age. He didn't get to experience and uh, be joyful at his own son's wedding. I'm gonna, he's going to come to my son's wedding. I hope, you know, my, I would probably feel jealous if it was me. I'd feel like, oh, you know, it's very big of him to be able to celebrate with us and not just be broken inside that his, his precious son was killed. But I don't know whether he'll be up to it or not. I'll say I'll understand if he doesn't want to come. But I want him to come. And let's say he wants to come. Now, let's say he was a mourner for a parent. He's not allowed to, right? A whole year, you're not allowed to celebrate in parties. But I really want him to come. There's tricks. Because people find it very hard to stay away. They say, well, maybe I can participate only in the chuppah, the ceremonial part. And there, there's no dancing and, and food, so it's not really a party. It's just a religious celebration, like we said about the breed. Some people say a breed is fine because it's a religious celebration. It's a mitzvah. You're participating in the mitzvah, but not in the party part. Some people do that. Some people say, even in the party, you can participate as long as you don't dance. What about eating? So, well, and what about being there when, other, when there's music? You're not supposed to be listening to music and enjoying music. Well, some people say, well, the music they play now is so bad. It's not, no. <laughs> you know what they do? Some people play the following trick. They say, okay, I'm going to invite you. What's that? No, no, that's not, that, uh, I mean, some people wear earplugs because the music's too loud. But <laughs> uh, the trick is as follows. You're allowed to participate in the wedding if you're not a regular participant. If you have a job. If you're working at the wedding. So you give your friend... I want you to be in charge of uh, photogra photography, or I want you to be in charge of making sure everybody has their seat. So you sort of give him like a task. And so he's at the wedding, not as a participant, but he's there as uh, service, uh, providing service. Yeah, it's a little tricky. Some people don't like it. They say, yeah, come on. At the end of the day, he's at the wedding with everybody else. He's wearing his finest. And what is he not going to eat? Some people say, yeah, he should not eat with everybody else. He should eat in the lobby or, you know, take his food outside. But that makes him feel worse. I don't, I don't know. But I'm not going to judge others. People, you know, they really uh, feel strongly about weddings, participating, their friends participating. And they do pull out all sorts of tricks, halachic loopholes for, to, to, to allow that. One example where it's a good idea to use one of these halach loopholes is, for example, a grandparent or an uncle. Somebody's a relative. Now, he's not one of the... He's not the, he's not the parent of the child getting married. The parent of the child is allowed to come because it will detract from the joy of the chatan and kalah that you're not allowed to do. So if anybody that he feels so strongly about that his... His wedding will not be complete if his, for example, his parents is not there, then the parents are allowed to participate. And usually the parents have a job anyways, but um, mm -hmm. they, they, they have some kind of service which they provide. But when it comes to somebody who's a little bit further removed, a brother, a sister, an uncle, a grandparent, 
they're officially not supposed to come. Let's say your grandfather's brother died a week before the wedding, a month before the wedding. So technically, for 30 days, he's not allowed to come to it, but his own grandson's wedding, you're going to tell him not to come? Mm -hmm. So we use the loophole for that. We say, okay, grandpa can come, um, and maybe he won't dance. Or he'll come and dance, but he's actually, he's got a job. His job is to make sure that the, uh, every table has the benchers on it. You know, sometimes they give out these different gifts to the, to the, to the guests. Uh, different different uh, tasks you can you can task them with, and then those loopholes are useful. If it's just for your friends, well, you should probably keep the halacha unless there's really a great need. There's there's room to work within the loopholes. Um, and, but in any case, the standard is shechianu. Don't say for thirty days or a year if it's a parent. Or a parent that that special extra long period of avilut was devised for a parent. Okay? Yes? Well, does this law apply to the spouse as well? Yes. 30 days. 30 days, not 12 months. Spouse, 30 days. The standard of it is. Shopping. Shopping, 30 days. No shachianu. After your spouse dies. No, no, no. no. The 12 months? No. Is that a person, uh, his father died? Yeah. Uh, does this uh, law only apply to his or her spouse? I, I, I see, I see, I see. So, on this, the simple answer is no. However, we do find customs of respect that you're supposed to show for your father-in-law or your mother-in-law. Give me an example of that in the Torah. Who showed respect to his father-in-law? Moshe to Yitro. Yitro comes and Moshe makes, you know, goes out to greet him and has a meal with him. We see that He's, he's called Yitro Chotein Moshe. He's the father-in-law of Moshe. So Yitro Moshe shows him a lot of respect, even though probably Yitro wasn't even Jewish. <laughs> and, but the laws of mourning, as we said, are connected to the laws of respect. So some people say that there are some measures of mourning which you express when your father or mother-in-law die, but it's not the same level of obligation as, as a uh, child. So your child is sitting shiva for her parents or his, sorry, your spouse is sitting shiva for their father or mother. Usually you're on, you're on call. You have to be the one who's cooking and cleaning because they're not allowed to. You're the one who's uh, making sure that, uh, you know, everybody gets to where they need to get to and that there's enough sidurim for the minyan. And you're, so usually... You are a participant in the mourning uh, process, but not actually as a mourner who sits on the ground and, and uh, you know, receives comfort. There are extreme cases where not even for a, a, a sibling or a, a spouse, uh, for their, but for a great rabbi. Some people who, t they, they treat their great rabbi, their mentor, if they had a mentor, they treat him like, uh, like a parent. And so they will do practices of mourning. We mentioned the tearing of the garment. There's such a, I've seen that when a son-in-law, Rav Lichtenstein, uh, was mourning for his father-in-law, Rav Yosef Dov Alevi Soloveitchik, the great Gadol Hador. So he did all sorts of practices of mourning. And of course he said the Kaddish. Even though I believe that Rav Soloveitchik had a son who was saying Kaddish, he also said the Kaddish. So you, yeah, there are some things you can take upon yourself. Sometimes the standard custom is that the Kaddish is said by men. It's something that's said in shul. Usually only men go to shul. They have an obligation of tefillah b'tzibur, of public prayer. Women uh, are exempt from public prayer, prayer in general. Most of our synagogues have a women's auxiliary. They do have a zrat nashim to allow women who want to come to come, and it's a good thing that they come. But should they sit at home and gossip? They should come to shul and pray to God. So it's a good thing that women come to shul, but it's not the same obligation that men have. Men have this obligation of communal prayer. In any case, Kaddish is usually part of that. And so therefore the standard custom has been for thousands of years that women do not say Kaddish. It's a modern phenomenon. You might have seen this. It's becoming more popular. Some women say, well, I know how to read. It used to be women didn't know how to read. 
and I can, I'm free, I have time, I have a, you know, enough help around the house. I don't have little kids now that need my care. I can come to shul even three times a day. Some women go to shul three times a day and they say, Kaddish. Mourners, Kaddish. Why not? So some people say, wait, this is a change, is it not the custom? And I'd say in most Orthodox circles, it's really uncommon. But it's becoming more popular in some circles. Women want to say Kaddish, especially if what happens if their father dies and there were no boys. There's only one daughter or five daughters, but there's no men to say Kaddish. Usually it's the son that says Kaddish for the father. So they'll say, well, I'll say it. The daughter will say Kaddish. Kaddish Yetoma. Um, there are some post that allow it, and they even encourage it, and they actually they bring precedents where it's not unheard of that a female will want to come into the synagogue and say Kaddish. And uh, a few years ago, there was a uh, horrible tragedy. You might have heard of the three boys were kidnapped. The entire country was searching for them for a couple of weeks. I can't remember how long it was. It was definitely a good three weeks, maybe more. And um, yeah, ultimately were found. They had been murdered. Same day. Yeah, yeah, they had been murdered, but they were hidden, so we couldn't find them. Finally, we found their bodies, and so there was the funeral. They made a funeral for the three of them together because it became a national mourning. It wasn't just these three families with their poor kids. And at that funeral, which was, of course, televised, and the entire country was... Israel went to war after, because of this kidnapping. We did not as big a war as now, but it was a, one of these... One of these uh, is that what it was called? Yeah, 2014. Yeah, 2014, about 10 years ago. Anyways, it was a, a major uh, national event, and so it was televised. And one of the mothers, I don't think all three... But one of the mothers decided to say Kaddish for maybe even two of the three, I'm not sure. They decided to say Kaddish for their children, for their sons. And this was, for many people, a shocker. They'd never seen anything like that. As I said, it's becoming more and more prevalent in some circles, in some communities. It's not prohibited by the halacha, but uh, unless some rabbis do prohibit it, some rabbis say uh, you're playing with the roles and... And, uh, but uh, according to the strict halacha, there's no, no prohibition being done necessarily. As long as there's a minyan of ten people, ten men, then a woman can say the Kaddish and men should answer. So that does happen, but that's a, that's a little bit of a, on the fringe right now. Um, but when there's no sons, so sometimes somebody else will say the Kaddish. If there's a daughter and she wants to say Kaddish, sometimes she will, but sometimes she won't, doesn't want to, sometimes she can't. She's got little kids. She can't go to shul a day, you know, three times a day. So who's going to say the Kaddish? Many times, it'll be her husband. And many times, it'll be her husband, the son-in-law. So you ask me, what about children-in-law? Of, of, do they mourn? Well, sometimes there's some elements of mourning. Sometimes there's even, you know, that they should participate with their wife. And sometimes it turns out that they're the ones saying Kaddish, if there's no brothers of the deceased. or Sometimes uh, sometimes saying Kaddish. I had a situation uh, about a year ago where a friend of ours in Canada, his mother died, and he's not religious. I think he's actually part of a Reconstructionist community. You've heard of that group? Yeah. In America. Anyways, they, they, he's uh, proud of his Jewishness. He participates in the community for what they do. Maybe on Shabbat he goes. But not every day, but he still has this concept. He knows that somebody should say Kaddish. And he knows that he really has an obligation to say Kaddish for his mother. But he knew he wasn't going to. So he turned to me and asked. Uh, he asked his friends, how can I get someone else to say Kaddish on my behalf? Now, usually, it's a little bit funny, really. It's a little bit strange. I can't put on tefillin today because I'm busy. Can you put on tefillin for me, Amram? The, the concept's ridiculous. I have to put on tefillin on my, myself. Can't have somebody else put on tefillin for you. 
But we do find this concept regarding Kaddish, is that if someone can't say Kaddish, you ask someone else to say it instead of you. It's not considered like putting on tefillin. Maybe it's, it's like an obligation towards your father more than it is a personal obligation. And so there's even an entire industry of people paying others. The post can say it's, be, it's actually better to pay someone to do it because then they're like your agent. Pay someone to say Kaddish for you. So I, you know, I run an organization to help Gehrim. And I said, well, this is a fundraiser. Okay, sure, I'll find you some converts who need a few extra bucks. And they'll say the Kaddish for you. And you give a donation to my organization. And that's what we did. Mm-hmm. I actually divided it up into three or four different Gehrim because it could be, you know, Quite a responsibility. Say Kaddish each and every prayer. You have to go to the synagogue three times a day and say the Kaddish. It can be quite uh, uh, an onus. So I split it up between a few guys and uh, gave them a little bit of pocket money. And we got a donation. And uh, that's it. So uh, say other people saying Kaddish for others. For example, Rav Michael Weinstein here, our colleague. He's saying Kaddish now. All of his parents are alive. Why do I see him saying Kaddish in Shul? No, his wife's parents are all alive as well. Baruch Hashem, they're young. He's saying Kaddish for who? Apparently, I have to ask him, but I think one of his students was killed in a car accident. Together with his father, who was injured, the father was injured badly, and the, the son was killed. They were The whole family was in the car, apparently. Mother's relatively okay. I'm not sure what the situation is now. In any case, their son had nobody to say, there was nobody to say Kaddish for their son, because the father himself was injured. He was in the hospital. And so Rav Michael took upon himself to say Kaddish for this stu- former student of his a little boy who was killed in a car accident, uh, basically doing a favor for the father who had the obligation to say Kaddish at least for 30 days. I don't know. I have to see why he's continuing. I don't know if he is. It seems, seems like it's been more than 30 days. Maybe saying Kaddish for somebody else. I don't know. Yes? Is he allowed for the father to say Kaddish for the son? Yes, usually. So even though the original concept of Kaddish is for the son, says for the father, Basically, we say Kaddish for any of the seven relatives. Remember we said the seven relatives? Father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, and spouse. So for any, we, the custom is for 30 days, we say the Kaddish for any of those. Although really, the, the, the primary custom is a son for a father and mother. Yeah. Isn't it a bad omen to say Kaddish when your parents are alive? Good question. Good question. We are, I'm very hesitant to use these terms, omen, and it's very closely associated in my mind to superstitions, which is all sorts of beliefs that people have. Give me a superstition you've heard of. Uh, black cat. If a black cat passes you, you're going to have bad luck, right? Or what else? Breaking a mirror. Breaking a mirror is bad luck. What else? Walking under a ladder. As a shtuyot. As a shtuyot. You know what shtuyot are? Nonsense. It's nonsense. We grew up like that. It's part of Western culture. All these beliefs. Yeah? Touch wood. Touch wood. And uh, when I was a kid, this was, I don't know why, where I picked it up. I don't know. Someone's, you carry a rabbit's foot for good luck. This is a little piece of fur. It wasn't real. I don't think it was real. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hamsa, it's a, it comes from the Arabic world. This concept that you have, a, you put up a, a picture of a hand, so five fingers, and that's like a wards off the evil eye, and things, stuff like that. So there are all these things in the culture. However, I want to I say something. Some practices that seem very similar appear in Judaism. There are Jewish practices which are designed to ward off the evil eye. And there are Jewish practices which say that there are times of the seasons 
which are associated with the forces of evil and you should avoid them. There are such things in Judaism. And I want to say lahavdil, we say we separate. Our traditions are based on our mystical traditions, our holy rabbis. Maybe they know stuff about the world that we don't. Definitely, I don't know a lot about the mystical world. I'm not a great Kabbalist. But we received from the great Kabbalists all sorts of practices and traditions. And one of them is this idea of Ayin Hara, the evil eye. And usually the practice was, still is, that if your parents are alive, you shouldn't say the mourner's Kaddish, because you're not a mourner. And if you do say the mourner's Kaddish, Maybe that'll hasten the death of your parents. So many parents will get very angry if they see their kids saying Kaddish for them if, while they're still alive because they'll think, oh my gosh, he wants me to kick the bucket. He's trying to push me over the hill. <laughs> and it's considered disrespectful. So believe it or not, the, uh, Rav Michael, I know for a fact, he went up, to, he wanted to say Kaddish for his student. This young boy was killed in a car accident. Father couldn't say Kaddish. And he felt this, he also felt a sense of loss. And saying Kaddish, maybe he felt was an appropriate way to express himself. So he went to his parents and he asked them, do you give me permission? And if they said yes, then... They're the ones who should be concerned about, you know, an evil eye that, like, you know, this is going to hasten their death. But if they don't care about it, then they say, it's allowed. And so I think he did that. I think he asked permission. To his um, parents? To his parents. He asked his parents, who are alive. He asked them, I want to say Kaddish, but, you know, usually Kaddish is reserved for mourning for a parent. And in this case, do you give, are you worried about that? Are you, uh, some parents will say, no. You kidding? Say Kaddish when I'm alive? What, are you trying to kill me? It's a very deep-rooted belief. But uh, apparently his parents were okay with it. And they said it's not a problem. Okay. Enough about uh, death and dying. Let's pray for our soldiers. And our prisoners of war. Not war. Prisoners of kidnapping. Captives of, of peacetime. Of terrorists. Page 231. Amram, you got it? Did you pick up the tune already? You know the tune?
Um, we're going to start now, although we don't have anything to smell, the blessings on smell. We said that there's blessings before eating and after eating. The blessings on smell, there's actually blessings for all five senses. Eating, drinking. What are the other senses? Seeing. Sight. Feeling. Hearing. Or feeling, what do you mean? Touch. Touch. You mean touch. Touch is the only one that's rarely, I can't really find, can I put, put my finger on a blessing for touch? It's interesting. But all the other senses we have, for, so basically smell and sight. Smell, sight, and, and, and sound. And, and hearing. I bring something this one? Sorry? I bring something this one from upstairs. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. Now we just have a few minutes left, so we'll start today. Tomorrow, everybody bring something in to smell. Good smelling, hopefully. <laughs> Take a look on page 1079. There's four different blessings. Four, four types of, actually five blessings on types of pleasant smells. She, basically, smell. it's, it's a form of imbibing. It's a form of birkata ne'enin. You enjoy something by eating it, and you enjoy something by smell. The truth is, the smell, they say, is the most sublime of the five senses. It's the most ethereal, least physical. Because right? eyes, you can see material things, and hearing, you hear noises that, you know, something that makes noise. I just heard out the window. There's a car, some kind of a cleaning machine. It's something that relates to the physical world very much. Thunder you hear, and lightning you see. We'll see these blessings. But also smell, smell, sometimes you don't even see where the smell is coming from, and you smell it. It's sort of like the most the most spiritual of the senses. Now we all make this bracha at least once a week. When? Havdalah. The custom is we, make, we take some sweet smelling spices and we say the bracha on them as part of the Havdalah service. But it's not only relegated to Havdalah. If on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday you want to make uh, a bracha, you want to smell something nice, you go by and you buy some flowers for your wife. Yes. She smells them. Oh, it's so beautiful smell. She's supposed to say a bracha before the sweet smelling. Now the truth is, it's a little bit tricky. The flowers that they grow nowadays, ah, you're coming, okay, good. Um, the flowers they grow nowadays, a lot of them are, are, are planted, they're engineered, and their primary goal is sight. Some of them don't have any smell. Some of them even, they took out the smell somehow. But the, you're supposed to, the main reason that people buy flowers today is for the way they look, not for the way they smell. But, so there's different halachot uh, about the laws of blessings on smells, which will continue. But Zatashem tomorrow, Rabbi Huda is going to teach a little bit more.